Hi, my name is John Brezen from NUI Galway, the National University of Ireland Galway, and um, I'm going to be giving you this um, video series of lectures on the fundamentals of electrical and electronic engineering. So a good place to start is, well, what is electrical or electronic engineering, or EEE for short, and um, why do we need it? So there's a variety of definitions of what's electrical and what's electronic. Um, some people often consider electrical to be the exact same as electronic engineering, that they are interchangeable terms. Others consider that electronic engineering is perhaps a subset of electrical engineering. Here's two definitions that I particularly um, find useful. One is thinking of electrical engineering in terms of how electricity or electrical power is um, transmitted and utilized and brought from one place to another. Um, that includes things like power transmission, electrical machines, power electronics, and so on. Um, in terms of electronic engineering, we can think of how electricity is being used to process information, to communicate information, to bring it from one place to another. And um, that includes things like communication systems in terms of um, radio and TV and so on, um, computers, and obviously things like microprocessors, integrated circuits within those computers, and the various systems in those um, that enable the transfer of, of information from one place to another. I'm not sure if you've seen this TV show, but it's um, it's called Revolution, and it kind of imagines a future where electricity has um, basically been wiped out by some kind of global um, catastrophe. And um, it imagines, I suppose, a world where life is, is uh, quite changed by this um, lack of electricity. So it's an interesting thought, and indeed, in relation to um, this course, I'm trying to see if you can imagine a world without any electrical or electronic um, systems. So we can think of obviously the impact that would have on mass communication in terms of having no radio or no TV um, or internet connect connectivity as um, we've become so used to now. Um, no telephones whether they are landlines or a mobile. Also in terms of things like buildings, you know, we can't maybe build the buildings as easily. We, we don't have cranes, we don't have um, the various um, uh, construction systems are used to create these buildings, but then if we actually had a building, well, we couldn't even have a um, electrical lift to go from the top to the bottom. We would have difficulties with air conditioning, with um, getting around the building, I suppose. And then on a smaller scale, we think of things like computers, um, tablets, video games, and so on. So more fundamentally, I suppose, you know, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to imagine how we could be without electricity, without the power that kind of um, powers all the things we use all the time our lights in our homes, the lights on the streets and so on, the variety of electronic devices we've become used to from our watches to our clocks. Um, I suppose more importantly in terms of medical technology and um, things that are vital to um, survival in hospitals like um, ECGs, um, heart systems and so on. And um, then of course the stuff we're, again, we, we're used to in our houses like our fridges, our freezers, our washing machines and um, so on. And then in terms of how we get from one place to another, so the traffic control systems that um, allow us to navigate with our cars, the cars themselves, which are powered by electricity and increasingly by electronic um, systems, trains, um, planes, the whole um, navigation systems, the radars and so on, that allow us to basically um, get uh, around more easily than we used to be able to before. So I think you'll probably agree um, that if you imagine such a world, it would be pretty primitive, it would be very difficult for us to survive in it. And um, I suppose ultimately it would be very hard for us to live in, um, given all those things, uh, or the absence of all those things. So maybe just um, for a minute, you could try and think of three uh, of the most important electric or electronic technologies that have improved quality of life for us here. And um, it could be, a variety of things. It could be something that is so pervasive that you just can't imagine life without it. It could be something you carry on your person. It could be maybe something you use more frequently, something that's um, maybe just once in a year that is actually vital to how you actually um, live or how many people could actually survive. So it's interesting actually to see where electricity and electronics came from and it's actually a story that goes back quite a long time. I was surprised when I started um, researching this actually how far back um, electricity um, goes. 
Electricity is often strongly tied to magnetism, and they are, in fact, um, very interrelated. Um, so it's actually interesting that the earliest story of electricity or electromagnetism electromagnet goes back um, to the um, third millennium BC. So um, it's a story that's recorded, which is about the Yellow Emperor of China, um, a person called Huang Di, who basically um, was in a battle with his enemies. And according to the story, he had a what was called a south pointing chariot. And this south pointing chariot allowed him to find his way out of a miasma that was uh, basically enveloping him and his enemies. And indeed, through the uh, use of this south pointing chariot, he managed to escape the fog and um, eventually win the battle. Um, going uh, forward in time to the 500s BC uh, in Greece, Thales found that if he rubbed um, the material amber with some soft cloth, that it in turn attracted small bits of straw. So this was, I suppose, one of the first recorded discoveries of static electricity. And indeed, it was followed up later on um, by a number of scientists in the um, 1500s and 1600s. And uh, hopping right forward um, nearly 2,000 years to um, the 1700s, um, we have two people who I suppose who are doing um, related work to uh, follow on from the discoveries of people around the idea of static electricity and um, certain materials attracting um, items. And one of those was Stephen Gray from England, who described the idea of having conducting and insulating materials. So some materials were um, were, were good for um, conducting electricity and other ones were, were, were not. And indeed, um, across the channel in France, um, Charles de Fay found that um, charges, like charges, repelled and unlike um, ones attracted each other. Um, this is a picture we, which you might not have seen before, but you've probably seen some kind of variant on it. And it's a picture of one of the founding fa fathers of the US, Benjamin Franklin. And as you may know, Franklin had this um, theory that um, the electricity that was in lightning in the sky was very similar to the electricity that people were countering. Um, and he basically did an experiment where he had a kite um, tied to a key and he uh, was trying to draw electricity from the sky. And uh, then of course we had uh, people like um, Galvani and Volta and they had a famous um, rivalry um, to try and discover the nature of electricity. Um, Galvani had a, a experiment where basically he uh, was able to make a pair of frogs legs jump by um, connecting um, a metal connection between one end of the legs and the other end. And he posited that this was a kind of form of inherent animal electricity that was actually within the, um, the frogs legs. Volta on the other hand felt that there was another reason for this. And he went and tried to reconstruct or redo the experiment in a very similar manner, but without the presence of any kind of animal material connecting the uh, two sides. And he, I believe he, he tried a couple of different materials before eventually he created what was called the voltaic pile. And the voltaic pile was basically very similar to a, um, a, a battery. And um, indeed he was able to replicate the effect that Galvani had had shown in the frog's legs um, and showed that it wasn't some kind of um, animal electricity, but rather this phenomenon could be created through an artificial means. And uh, the Botte uh, pile and, of course, voltage are all named after, um, after Alessandro Volta. So then, um, hopping forward again to the 1800s, we had a variety of people who were discovering um, relationships between um, electricity and magnetism. So we had Ersted, Faraday and Henry, all finding in at different times that um, either magnetism or a magnetic field could be used to create an electric current, or in the reverse direction that an electric current basically created a magnetic field around it. Also, um, soon after we had discoveries by um, a variety of people in terms of how electricity behaves and how it's related to current, how um, current actually um, behaves in a circuit, um, resistance and its relationship to current and voltage were all discovered by the likes of Ampere, Ohm, Gauss, Linz and Kirchhoff. 
So then, um, I suppose the applications of electricity, um, one of these would be quite well known, which is the telegraph. And indeed, although the telegraph has gone by the wayside, it is um, it was quite a long-lived technology. In fact, um, up to um, 30, 40 years ago, the telegraph was still quite popular. But its uh, story goes back to 1837. And indeed, um, another um, interesting story and a, a sad story about Samuel Morse. So Samuel Morse wasn't um, an inventor, but he experienced a tragedy in his life in that he received a letter from someone informing him that his wife was quite ill. And by the time the letter arrived to him, and by the time he actually was able to go and uh, return home, his wife had unfortunately died. He afterwards devoted his life to try and understand other ways of communicating uh, more quickly. And it was through a meeting with somebody who was working in the area of electromagnetism that he went on to study and derive the idea of a telegraph. And indeed, he created the, um, the first successful um, electric telegraph in, the, uh, in, in 1837. Going on from that, again, back to the theory, uh, Maxwell was a person who came up with some very famous um, laws governing electricity and magnetism. And he also deduced that the uh, waves in uh, electromagnetism were basically traveling at the speed of light. It was actually realized then later on by Heinrich Hertz, who was a, a German um, physicist who actually went and produced um, such waves. This is a great picture. It's one of Nikola Tesla. And it's actually a multi-exposure uh, picture. Tesla was a fantastic inventor and also um, very effective at publicizing his, his work. He was actually, uh, he actually worked for um, Edison. And we know Edison, of course, as the inventor of the long, la uh, long life light bulb and also very much associated with things like the record player with um, motion picture cameras and so on. Tesla had a very um, big impact on our lives because he was one of the developers of the first modern AC uh, supply systems which uh, bring electricity to our homes and also of the AC induction motor. Another interesting story is that of Alexander Graham Bell. Um, we often think of Bell as being the person who made the first phone call and indeed that phone call happened in March 1876. What's also interesting is that he was also a very astute business person and he also had a, a good team of lawyers. And in fact, he and another person called Elisha Gray basically um, submitted a patent for the telephone on the exact same day, I believe it was uh, in February 1876. Um, because of uh, Bell's um, superior business savvy and also the fact that he um, um, had, a, I suppose, a good team working with him, he actually is, um, I suppose, remembered, whereas Elisha Gray is, is not. And of course, there is a variety of discoveries, not just by Bell, but by the company that Bell founded afterwards, as we'll see. Um, anyway, Galway has a nice connection to the story of electricity and electronics, and that is due to um, an Anglo-Irish um, professor called George Johnston Stoney. Um, Stoney was a professor at um, NUI Galway uh, from 1852 to 1857 when it was called Queen's College Galway. And he went on to uh, work in various roles in the Irish state. And during that time, he came up with the theory that current consisted of small particles, which he termed electrons. And indeed, he's the person who we attribute the name or the term electron to. I think this is uh, fascinating when we think of how pervasive electronics and the word electron uh, has become in our everyday usage through um, email and so on. And of course, if you Google for email, you'll find you know tens of billions of results and the same for electronic, there will be billions of results for, for that term, uh, stemming back to Stoney. Vacuum tubes came soon after in the 1900s. Um, it was found that an atom traveling from one end of a vacuum tube to the other could actually detect the presence of radio signals. And indeed, later on, uh, vacuum tubes were um, were created that would actually allow you to amplify these signals. And of course, this led to the development of uh, not just radio, but also of radar systems and of television. Um, another Irish connection to the story is in the form of Marconi, who was um, an Italian inventor, but had, who had Irish heritage. As you may know, Marconi was very active in the area of radio communications. 
and then he, he set or he sent the first radio transmission from the UK to Canada. Um, and later on, he set up a number of radio stations, uh, radio transmission stations around the world. This picture here is from um, nearby um, us here in Galway. It's from uh, Clifton, which is um, west of west of Galway. And indeed, this is one of the stations that was used to communicate with um, Canada and also with the UK. This is another great picture. It's of one of the first um, general purpose computers, what was called the ENIAC. And you saw the vacuum tube we had earlier on. This uh, computer was built from 17,000 of those vacuum tubes. Um, indeed, a real um, feat of engineering in that it had not just all of these vacuum tubes, but also tens of thousands of other components, including resistors, capacitors, switches, um, and some uh, absurd amount of hand soldered connections. Um, while it was um, a very uh, important development in terms of being the first general purpose computer, um, because most of the other computers before that were specific to some kind of purpose. Um, it suffered from, I suppose, issues with the vacuum tubes in terms of if one blew, there was quite a lot of work in terms of how you figured out which one was gone and how to fix it. Um, going forward in time to the 40s, um, after the World War, we have the transistor, which was invented um, in Bell Labs. So we mentioned Bell earlier on. And transistor is such a huge... Um, hugely important step in the world of electronics. This is a, a replica of the first um, transistor created by Bardeen, Britain and uh, Shockley. And these transistors were the fundamental component of what we call integrated circuits, which are basically groupings of transistors that are used to perform certain um, logical operations. The integrated circuit was built by Texas Instruments um, Kilby and his team and indeed, I think one of the most fascinating implementations of integrated circuits from the 60s is this thing. This is the Apollo guidance computer. And of course, this was the system that was used in the moon landings. It was basically their onboard computer, which consisted of 4,000 um, logic gates, which in turn would have um, had a variety of transistors used to implement that, that computer logic. So hopping forward then to the 70s, we had um, the first commercial microprocessors. So these are the first microprocessors that could be used to power um, things like uh, computing systems. Um, two important ones. One that was created by Ted Hoff, um, the Intel 4004, and his team, and also the Texas Instruments uh, TMS-1000. Um, another uh, great story of rivalry is that of Martin Cooper of Motorola. Here's Martin from a picture from five years ago, and uh, he is credited as being the inventor of the mobile phone. And he made the first mobile phone call to um, Joel Engel of um, Bell Labs. So um, I can imagine that must be an interesting call when he picked up his um, mobile phone and uh, made the first call to his rival. And uh, indeed, another um, um, interesting step is the development of, of, the, of the smartphone. And uh, here is a picture of the iPhone, as uh, Steve Jobs said, an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator all rolled up on one device. 